everyone. Welcome back to the pair program. Uh, Tim Winkler here with Mike Gruen. Mike, today marks the end of a pretty epic run with one of the the goats of the of the game show uh, uh, genre with Pat Sajak. Are you familiar with this? I am. Wheel of Fortune. Yep. Last episode. Yep. Is wow. uh, is the is Wheel of Fortune going off, or is he go? I know no, that he Wheel of Fortune's still going. That's why Pat Sajak's retiring. Right, I heard Pat Sajak's retiring. Um, that's right. Yeah. Maybe. End of an era. End of an era. That's right. He, yeah, uh, I feel I think like he's a Ryan local Seacrest Seacrest is coming in. I feel like so he's a big he's a big Caps fan. I know he's a big Caps fan. Yeah, you know, there's I don't no know if he's from DC. Or there's not, no accounting but. for taste. He must be from the area to be a Caps fan. Why else would you be a Caps fan? Okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Maybe R- Rangers uh, trash talker. Um, <laughs> I, I I was gonna actually go with my pairing of of Vanna White and Pat Sajak as one of the one of the best one two combos. But Definitely get combo. I got something else. I got something else. Good, but good. Uh, yeah, I just got to give a shout out. That was a you know a legend uh, in the game show host uh, arena. So mm-hmm. good on you, Pat. And and but, uh, ending on top. <laughs> That's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. he's going out on his own terms. Exactly. That's always nice. Yeah. Uh, all right. Excited for today's episode. Uh, so this is another one of those mashup episodes where we, we bring in a founder uh, from a startup and we also bring in an investor who's partnering with that founder. So kind of gives us this diverse perspective and insight into the startup journey, you know, investment strategies, how the two kind of see eye to eye and what they saw in one another as well. Um, so today we have Shane Bigelow, founder and CEO of, of Champ Titles, and Mike Nan- Nanizzi? Nanizzi? How, how am I pronouncing that, Mike? Uh, it's Smith, actually. <laughs> it's, uh, no, it's, uh, n- it's uh, Nanizzi. Nanizzi, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Mike, Nan- Mike Nanizzi Smith, no, Mike Nanizzi joining yeah. us, uh, head of venture investments at WR Berkeley. Uh, Shane, Mike, thanks for joining us on the PEAR program. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks. Absolutely. All right. Now, before we dive in, we do kick things off with our um, flagship segment, the pair program. Uh, here's where we all kind of go around the room, spitball a complimentary pairing of our choice. Mike, you always lead us off. What What's uh, your pairing for today? So, yeah. Uh, so I gave it some thought. Uh, <laughs> like what? Two, uh, a minute of thought? A good, good minute and a half, two minutes. And uh, no, and it just came to me. Um, uh, fire pits and friends. Uh, we just we've had a fire pit for a while. And uh, the weather's been that like bright time of, you know, in the evening, having a fire, inviting people over. Um, it's just nice, uh, just a nice way to spend the time. And I can just stare at a fire. I don't know if anybody else can, mm-hmm. but I can think and just stare at a fire or have a nice conversation, whatever. Um, so, yeah, that's my pairing. Fire, fire pits and friendship. That's a, that's solid. I actually just celebrated my birthday you know, the other weekend and uh, we rented a cabin out in West Virginia and stayed up till, you know, pretty, pretty wee hours in the morning, just around the fire pit. You yeah. just, something about it. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a, it's a good, good bond. Definitely. Good stuff. All right. Yeah. We will accept that. Mike. <laughs> it's a good, good one. I, I, I'm, I'm pretty pumped for this one. I'm going to present something that I think will resonate with, with our guests. Um, Got a fr- frustratingly perfect pairing for today. I'm going to go with the Department of Motor Vehicles and ridiculously long waits. Um, so DMV and long waits, I think this is a universal experience for folks, something that everyone's got you know, a good story about, um, just kind of navigating the bureaucracy and inefficiencies of some of our beloved DMVs. Um, I, I do... Uh, I do get excited when I hear about technologies or uh, innovative solutions and ways to to streamline this and and to uh, shorten some of those timelines. But um, I, I'll also say that there's something nice about uniting our country when sharing these war stories about long waits at the DMV. It seems like something that everybody can relate to. I mean, to shared enemies point. are always nice. <laughs> 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 so I, I, I'm going to stick with that. I'm going. I'm going with yeah, DMVs and and ridiculously long waits. Uh, with that, I'll pass it over to our guest for their intros and pairings. So Shane, how about a, a quick intro and and your pairing? Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Um, so I'm Shane Bigelow, co-founder and, and CEO of Champ. Uh, yeah, my my pairing. I probably should have done something with the industry, but uh, you beat me to it. 
you know, thankfully in our states, those waits are getting to be uh, a lot, lot shorter, if not non-existent as we move people from paper to digital and let them do the things they need to do at the DMV from the comfort of their own homes. But uh, my pairing is a little more social. I'm going with martinis and oysters. Nice. Oh. Mm. You want to expand on it? Any um, anything specific that you love about the the, the one two punch? You want to swallow that ice cube? <laughs> I didn't want to. I didn't want to interrupt your lunch there. Sorry. About that. Late lunch, liquid lunch. You're you're having your oysters. It's fine. Um, so uh, you know, I just I find that when you're with friends and you can order up a. A gluttonous amount of oysters. Uh, the, the, the right thing to do is to pair it with a martini, and I don't know, just something about that together, just as a fun experience that you know you don't do that, but maybe a few times a year if you're lucky. Um, it's just fun. I got to do it recently with a, a couple of great friends and my wife uh, as we uh, we were on a trip together. So just good memories. That's, That's awesome. great. You go, you go, uh, dirty martini, or are you just go on just straight, straight martini? No, the only olives I like are in the oil, but other than that, I won't eat them. Uh, so no, I'm, uh, it's, it's, it's a, it's, it's straight up. Uh, most people don't even think it's a martini. I, I, the way I order it is, uh, up with a twist, no vermouth. And I only have to throw in just the no vermouth for the, for the bartenders <laughs> that don't understand what up means. Just a bottle of vodka, please. Cheers to that. All right. Good stuff. Appreciate it. Um, uh, Mike, how about yourself? Quick uh, intro and, and uh, your pairing. Sure. So I'm Mike Nanitzi. Um, I run the Venture Arm for WR Berkeley. Connecticut-based property and casualty insurance company. We're going to say, so my, I don't know why this came to mind, but it did. Um, it, I'm going to go with Lee Majors and Heather Thomas, the fall guy. Wow. Okay? Um, because nice. I think that was one of the most perfect television pairings I can remember as a kid. So I'm going to go with that. Nice. Did you see the, uh, the movie? I did not. The movie is, uh, it's good. I, I, it was an enjoyable, uh, we went for Mother's Day, actually. It was my wife's choice. It was a fun movie. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Okay. And, I might, I might do that. And there were nice little Easter eggs throughout. Like, it wasn't, oh, they, they did a little bit of, there's some nice, like, stuff in there. Uh, so, yeah, it was, it was an enjoyable movie. Yeah. I like the, I mean, the truck. There were lot, lots of things about the show I like. Yeah, I had the yeah. uh, I had a Matchbox car that was exactly like the truck from the thing. Play with it all the time it was great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's all. I don't think we've had any like actor actor pairings like that. I know. I was just uh, thinking that first of we, its we, kind. We need to it's creative. I think we need to bring in Trying more of to those. do some. You know, appreciate yes. it. Creative. All right, good stuff. Well, let's uh, you know, make the most of our time and jump into the the heart of our discussion. So, as I mentioned, we're going to be. Un unpacking this partnership between you know Champ and, and WR Berkeley uh, on this episode, and you know, understanding how this strategic partnership came to be. But you know, first and foremost, I, I want to expand on the story and the impact of of Champ. So I'll start with you, Shane. You know, what what kind of inspired you to to start Champ and describe a little bit more about like the problems that you're solving? Sure. Uh, you know, there really wasn't like a an aha moment. I think sometimes people think I was waiting in line at the at DMV. The DMV. And like, yeah. <laughs> oh, I got to solve this. It's like, it was really, you know, 20 some odd years of experiences in different industries. My, my first startup was in the automotive finance sector. So I watched as lenders had a problem getting liens on and off of car titles and the inefficiency that that created for lenders, the the costs that it added for the consumers, it just felt a little bit ridiculous. But I wasn't solving that problem in that first startup. I was solving a different problem for lenders. Fast forward a bit, I did a few other things, and at one stage, wound up working for a pretty large firm on Wall Street. And one of the things we were trying to do was to put money to work around the world. And one of the things you pretty quickly realize is that in the developed markets, we take it for granted that we have these systems of record that allow us to pretty easily get a home loan, get a car loan, get a credit card. Uh, in the developing world, those systems of record don't really exist. And as a result, you know, lending is stifled, insurance is stifled, um, the ability for you to, you know, keep 
track of your assets across generations is is stifled and it really hinders the ability for those economies to grow and that that just bothered me like it just bothered me that there was part of the world that has every bit the skill set that the rest of the world has but because of the infrastructure of their um their governmental systems they they couldn't do what we could do and it really probably keeps people poor longer than they ever should be um and so when I left Wall Street and and decided with a good friend to start this company, um, you know, he was in automotive retail and we came together and said, you know, this problem is, has been around for a long time. This problem of how do you make it easier for lenders to lend, insurers to insure, uh, for consumers to get these these loans on cars, to trade their cars with their neighbors why is this so hard, right? Why is this so complex? It really shouldn't be. And we set out to try to solve that problem by pursuing what we refer to as a, a B to G to C model. You know, we're the business, we go to government, uh, we convince government to partner with us so that we can replace their system of record, give them a system of record that their constituents, that's the C, that their constituents really want, that they that that moves at the speed of the business of their constituents because as you mentioned with the lines of the DMVs DMVs aren't generally known for moving at the speed that people want them to move at but that might have been acceptable 20 years ago when the technology didn't really permit it today the technology permits it and it's more about the states finally recognizing that they probably shouldn't be a software company Right. My biggest competitor is when states decide that they're a software company and um, that most states are getting away from that. And so all of this kind of came together over, you know, 20 plus years to say this is a problem that we can solve in this country and make the experience better for consumers, make their costs lower, allow lenders to have an easier path to lend, insurers an easier path to insure. And uh, that's probably part of why, besides my uh, unabashedly awesome looks that Mike and I came together, um, it, you know, he was, I think, first just attracted to, to you know, this wonderful face that I have and uh, <laughs> all of the jowls that have developed and the gray hair and the wrinkles and all the other things, um, but also maybe a, a bit about how we're trying to transform an industry that uh, doesn't change too often. And for the record, I, I I actually had jet black hair before I met Shane. <laughs> <laughs> that gives you any indication. That's true. I have, to, I have to imagine he took you out for martinis and oysters to get this kind of deal established. Nah, I mean, we, we, we went out and had a few drinks uh, <laughs> here and there. No oysters. No, no oysters. oysters. That's, for, that's only for friends, I guess. <laughs> yeah, or like, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Or or people he's really trying to impress. <laughs> That's right. Well, I, I want to expand on on the WR Berkeley side of things and how that came to be, but I, I want to just pull a little bit more on the, the champ thread here. Um, because I was doing my own research in terms of some of those benefits. You talked you covered a couple of a couple of them like efficiency and bringing down the cost. Uh one of the things that stood out to me, you know, was the uh, impact on on the environment, too, that some of this has. Can you can you just kind of briefly touch on that, uh, expand on that benefit as well? Uh, I Yeah, sure. Uh, by the way, just kind of a funny aside. When you said uh, efficiency, the the way you said it made me think of a fish in sea. So um, <laughs> just never that never heard anyone say it like that. So now I'm like, I'm chuckling inside. So fish and sea. Yeah, you're right. Sea, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, well, you know, that the, the sea, as we all know, gets polluted because people, um, don't take the time they should to worry about the environment or maybe do some of the basic things that can be done to try to help it. And, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not out, you know, um, hanging out, protesting, uh, companies or anything like that. Um, I'm looking for places where there's a place to really do something basic that just simply helps um, the, 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 you know, the environment and the associated companies that, that, that deal with these issues. And so let me give you an example. You wouldn't think that titling would somehow solve an environmental problem. Well, okay, so there's the first part where maybe we make things digital instead of paper. So there's some 
uh, a lot of trees, a lot of paper that's saved, you know, paper production is, 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 is in its own way, um, not great for the world, but nonetheless, so maybe that helps a bit. But one of the really exciting places is that uh, when cars need to be recycled, uh, so they get in an accident and they need to uh, be parted out so that the good parts can be sold again and reused uh, and the bad parts can can be disposed of. Um, that's a tricky process, right? Cars are one of the few things in uh, this world that are 100% recyclable. And I don't think people realize that. So when you see these salvage yards and you look at them and you say, okay, so everything in there has value, um, it's, it's somewhat intriguing. Well, the problem is that, you know, 10 years ago, and Mike can tell you this from the insurance side, 10 years ago, 6% of insurance claims were total losses where the car it was end of life because of the, the complexity of the accident or the damage to the vehicle. Today, that number is 26% of all claims are total losses. Now, most of that has to do with the added technology that's in cars that makes it you know, easier to do a lot of damage quickly with even a minor accident. But the reality is those cars, when they're totaled, they go sit in a salvage yard on average for about 55 days. So they're leaking fluids, causing problems, not being recycled. Um, EVs have a tendency because of the batteries to catch on fire more frequently. And so all of these things are doing bad things to the earth. And it's really no one's fault because the salvage yards are doing exactly what they should do, trying to shepherd this car through to be recycled. The recyclers want to buy the car as fast as possible because the part value is depreciating the longer they have to wait to get the parts. And the insurance carrier that insured the car, well, they want the, the, the car to be sold quickly so they can recoup some of what they paid out on that claim. But you're waiting for 55 days for a piece of paper from the government to say that the policyholder who got the money from the carrier is no longer the owner. It's crazy. It doesn't make any sense that it should take that long and that that car should have this opportunity to do damage in the meantime. So we speed that up to just a few hours. And that's a huge change for the industry. And it's a huge change for the environment. It's, a, it's an easier way for these salvage yards to become smaller uh, because they'll turn the cars faster. So they need less land. Um, and that's just one of the easy things that can be done when technology is applied in an area that you wouldn't normally expect would have a positive impact on the environment. In fact, it has a, a pretty large impact on the environment. Yeah, I'm really glad I asked the question because I was thinking of it from the you know, from the trees and the paper perspective, and you flipped it on me and yeah, opened my mind up there. It's it's fascinating. Um, I I I want to pass it over to Mike now and and just you know obviously give us a little bit more uh, background on you know the unique approach that uh, WR Berkeley takes from an investment perspective. Why it's a, a different type of approach than your traditional VC. And then I'd love to hear how, you know, the story between how you and Champ kind of got connected. Sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, so, so just to back up. So I joined Berkeley about seven and a half years ago. And I joined a role that was created to make financial investments in technology companies. Where, where we are a little different, I guess, is we aren't managing other people's money. And so we don't have, there's a lot of venture firms raise uh, partner funds, limited partner funds, and then deploy those. And so we, we typically, and that has a whole series of knock-on effects. We've kept it pretty simple. We invest our own capital. And so that's number one, I, I guess. And number two is, unlike a lot of, more traditional corporate venture arms that have strategic requirements. So they need to may have their investments uh, achieve some sort of strategic imperative. We don't have those either. So that that's sort of what makes us unique is we're not structured like traditional venture firms, but we also don't tend to invest like more traditional corporate venture arms. Uh, and so, you know, our mandate and uh, my mandate is sort of pretty pretty broad, but our approach is pretty simple. We want to invest in companies that can create value for themselves and their customers at the same time. 
and that technology allows them to do that at scale. So pretty simple. I think Champ is a perfect articulation of that. And so that's generally sort of how we think about the types of models that we're interested in. I'd say, but more important than that, in in terms of like the financial profile and the opportunity, I really do see us just investing in people, you know, and we're, we need to make sure that we believe in the leaders of these companies. We need to make sure that we can trust them, that, that we can have a, the kind of relationship that we're trying to help them and they want us to be successful too. And I mean, these sound like really basic attributes uh, that any investor would have and that any company would have, but it doesn't always work that way. And so I'm really proud of what we've done and the companies we've invested in and and sort of really proving to them that this is what we want to bring to the table. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something that you mentioned in our you know previous discovery call that I'd I'd love to you know, hear a little bit more. Maybe you can use Champ as a specific use case or or another uh, company within the portfolio. But have the 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 advantage of having the footprint as an insurance company and the ability to kind of you know plug and play maybe you know your portfolio's technology offerings into the hands of real users, uh, maybe partners. Uh, to 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 try these products in a true production environment, can can you m- expand on that or share an example of this? And you can use Champ or you can use another example as well. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm Shane. I, I imagine you're all right with me talking about what we did together. Yeah. I mean, I think there was a time I don't know, a couple of years ago maybe when Shane came to me and said, you know, we would love to be able to prove that we can process a title for an incident in one state through a different state. And so we have a collection of small insurance companies that all do different things and lots of them do those things in different places. And so she said, I, we want to process a title in this state and it, we'd like it to come from another state. And so he's okay. So I found, you know, a, an operating unit at, at Berkeley that had auto exposure and had claims that sort of fit the profile Shane was asking for. Uh, and so we asked them, we said, hey, listen, can we, can you try this out? Can you try this out? And, uh, and they said, sure. And so we had to kind of jump through a couple of hoops just because it is a little different. And then um, typically the way insurance companies operate and Insurance companies are really good at having processes in place that they follow no matter what. And so we were able to sort of get that uh, to a point where we could get it done. And and so we were able to get that transaction done. I don't know, was it probably two years ago, Shane, something like that? Yeah. Um, and then, I, you know, because my thought was like, like when I look at companies and they say, here are all the things we can do. It's a very different bucket than when companies say, here's what we've done. Mm -hmm. So I, to the extent that we can help, you know, our portfolio companies do that, um, you know, this was an opportunity to, to make that, to make that happen. Yeah. And Shane, I guess I'm, from your perspective, I mean, the the value of something like that, you know, obviously, you know, capital is, is where everybody's mind initially goes to when you're thinking about, you know, a, a venture partner. Um, but some of those other areas, like I look at this as like network access, right? Um, incredibly valuable. You know, w- w- were you anticipating that going into this? Or I guess what was your your thoughts when you kind of, you know, experienced some of that value? Uh, you know, we've been lucky in that. Um Every round we've we've done since we started has been oversubscribed, um, and that we've had competing term sheets all along the way. But uh, the reason why we initially went with with Berkeley and they've been involved in everything we've done ever since then is uh, it wasn't because they had the highest valuation. Um, they didn't. It, it it's because they were the right partner, right? They have the right culture. They have the right uh, I think 
mindset of stewardship over their companies that isn't always the way you feel when you're inside of a portfolio for a, a venture firm. Um, but Berkeley is very different. I mean, for all the way from their CEO, Rob, who is just an amazing CEO and leader, uh, all the way down to the, the, the newest of employees that we might interact with on a particular transaction. There's a this mindset of care and stewardship for what they're a part of, what they help create. Um, it's an ownership uh, ethos that I don't think is 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 typical to find in companies. And as we were going through the initial process back in the Series A, where we now just completed our Series C, but when we were going back through the Series A, it was really clear that they were different. I didn't know, you know, you hear from, from firms uh, when they're competing to put money in, you hear from them, oh, you know, we have business units, you can try this out. And, you know, you kind of, you don't know for sure until you actually try it. Um, but boy, was it real, right? We, we, we had a need, we wanted to prove something out. Um, we didn't want to, you know, try to route through uh, a long sales cycle to convince someone we needed we needed an early adopter and who better than someone who has already invested in us, knows us, uh, trusts us, we trust them. And it, you know, it, it set, it, it set a standard for a transaction that had never occurred in the industry before. And it told the industry that this is possible and we just proved it not in theory, but in reality. And to Mike's point, uh, it was the stepping stone for one of our largest products that's in market today. So. Um, yeah, it's very, very unique dealing with um, an investor that has that type of uh, mentality, care, stewardship, and, and ownership ethos inside of the, the way they, they live their, their daily business lives. I would definitely, just coming from startups and having worked with many different investors, it is very rare to find that partnership that like really that they're there for more than just the, the, the outcome. Right, that they're there to help with the journey and make the connections, and um, it, I think it is quite rare. So that's awesome. Um, and the, your point about the like lower valuation, I think there's too many founders that focus on that number and not enough on what's who's giving me this money and what are they going to be able to do? Like, how are we going to help each other beyond just this sort of financial transaction? Yeah, and Mike, you you know when we when we first spoke as well, you know, you mentioned that you only deal with a handful of companies underneath the portfolio. And that's a very intentional choice. So um, what, what kind of, what value does that create for founders like Shane, just being able to dedicate that much more attention to a, a handful of folks? I mean, I, I mean, that's probably a good question for Shane. I mean, if I think from our side, I just, so my general approach is I don't like to promise things that I'm not going to do. I don't, we're, we're not trying to, institutionalize this effort, right? We're not trying to scale. You know, I talk about wanting to invest in companies at scale. We're not trying to scale this, right? We're, we're trying to, I've been here almost eight years. We've made eight investments. We, we don't invest in a lot of companies. We're really careful about who we want to work with. And, uh, and we're going to do everything we can to help them get there. And so part of the ethos for me is like, if I did try to invest in 20 companies, then if Shane needs me for something, I, I'm not available because I'm in 19 other board meetings that season. You know, it's just and and I there are that does happen uh, more often than you might think. And so we try to tell people like, look, we're different. We want to help. We want to bring value where we can. And so we limit ourselves to our portfolio to make sure that we don't stretch ourselves too thin. I think that's the whole stretching thin. What ends up happening? I plenty of friends that are in VC, you know, that do this. They just spend all of their time with the companies that are struggling. They don't get to work with the ones that are doing well. They yeah. just spend their time on the ones that are having problems and um and and not you know. And I think you know if you're a company that's sort of in the middle, that's sort of on the cusp, that means you're not getting maybe that attention that you need to really get to that next level. I think you know. So I think that's really an an awesome approach. Shane, you're you're dealing with a number of different stakeholders. Um, you reference, you know, some of the the government stakeholders. What what are the biggest challenges that you feel like you run into 
um, you know, juggling so many of these different stakeholders? You know, it, it probably sits on a, on two fronts. The first is you know, we're going through in, in government, broadly speaking today, um, government in the United States is going through this uh, maturation process where they're, they're finally stepping out of uh, the technology building. Um, you know, I think for a long time, governments thought of themselves as, as software companies or, or IT companies. And, it, you know, probably the move from on, on-prem to cloud, right? I, I can still remember when governments were creating their own clouds. Like, you think about how silly that is in hindsight, right? Like, okay, Amazon and Google pretty much have this one figured out for you. Um, so, uh, y- you know, there's merit, I suppose, in some in some places within government uh, where you might need that, but but generally not, right? It's generally cheaper for the constituents of government if you're using the private sector and, um, you know, they're creating technology for you. So, th- so that th- that's the first thing to juggle is this change of mindset within government that, uh, has probably taken about 20 years to to take hold, but it's here, right? They, it's very difficult to keep up just with the expenses associated with software production today if you're on a government salary, right? My, my, the average wage of an employee at Champ probably far exceeds the average head of a DMV in most states, right? And that's not because we overpay. It's because that's what a software engineer costs, right? And and the, the reality is that if you are paying for that talent, you're generally creating some pretty good technology. And it's not exclusive to us, right? Other software companies do the same thing. Maybe even our competitors. I, I don't know, but um, but I'm, I'm confident other software companies do the same thing. So that's the first thing to juggle is that change, because government doesn't move quickly. So when they experience a change, it's it's pretty dramatic to the, their daily lives. The second thing is that you know, we've introduced inventions into the market, right? We we referenced one that we we did with Mike um, and and with W R Berkeley, um, it, you know. But there have been others. Uh, the the digital title, right? It sounds you know, for years states are talking about electronic titling. Well, we have the first digital title that truly is digital. You know, it's gone from being a paper based asset to now being something that can live entirely digitally and you know like like the boarding pass for airplanes there's a there's an arc of change that you go through i I remember when i was a kid boarding passes would be mailed to you with carbon copy pieces of paper and god forbid you lost the thing or like literally your dog ate it or your mom threw it away like you couldn't get another one or it cost you a hundred bucks or something silly and then eventually the airlines were like well you know what you can just print this at home and people were like, oh, my God, OK, print it at home. Now don't lose this. And it's like, wait a minute, maybe I can lose it. Maybe it really doesn't matter. And then now today, you don't even think twice about it. It's on your phone. You know, and think about what the, the airlines have been able to do by going through that transition. One, they've reduced the cost. They've made it easier for the consumer. Two, they've increased their own revenue streams, right? They've managed to now I go on the app. What do I do? I change my seat. I book my bags. I pay for oversized baggage. Uh, I might upgrade myself, um, you know, uh, if if, uh, if the opportunity is there. Uh, I might pick a meal, all right. I might pay for my Wi-Fi. All of these things are revenue streams. Now apply that to government, right? Government's under a, a tax crunch. Like nobody wants to pay more in taxes. But if the government's supplying a service that far exceeds what has been available in the past. People have shown a willingness to pay for it. Now, we're not in this business, but a great example is playing on your your joke from earlier on. People will pay many state governments in order to reserve their spot in line at the DMV. They'll pay $2, $5, $10, whatever it is to reserve their spot simply because they don't want to wait in line. Well, that's great. That's an extra $2, $5, $10 that the government didn't force on anyone, but made it an option that you could pursue. So the government can then collect less taxes. They collect user fees from people that are actually using the services. And we're doing the same thing in titling, right? We're making it so that lenders get a better way to put liens on and off of their titles. Car dealers get a better way to title their cars and move their assets and their inventory around. Insurance carriers can do the the total loss uh, solving of titling, like we talked about earlier with the environmental example. 
all of that comes with incremental benefits that benefit those companies, benefit their bottom lines, benefit their ability to compete with their competitors if they're doing it before everybody else. But it was supplied from government. So government should generate some more income as a result of that. And the users, not everybody in the system, but just the users are paying for it. So it's very fair in terms of the cost allocation for who picks up the tab. Um, and it's not the silliness of government, um, you know, like, like the, let me back up. This, the silliest thing that occurs in government is that they put out a bid for a contract and then they pay the vendor up front. Like what other industry actually pays up front before the service? You don't even pay your doctor up front, right? You, and, and so somehow the government is doing it exactly the opposite of the way that makes rational sense. They're paying a vendor up front a ton of money for a five-year, six-year, 10-year project. So the government, the, the vendor's incentives have immediately gone to zero to do anything quickly or anything particularly well. They're collecting maintenance fees every year on top of it. And the government just has to sit back and wait for the vendor. Like this is the silliest use of tax dollars. If, if all government contracts went to a place where they're only paying the vendor for performance, for actually changing the behavior that we wanted, in our case, moving someone from using paper to being digital, then imagine how much more efficient that capital is allocated. And by the way, the government doesn't have to pay vendors like us. The users pay for using it. And we could rip so much excess out of government if we started to change contracting and the way we think about it that way. And, um, and the reality is like, that's all the stuff we're juggling right now. Government's realizing that they can, that they can actually make this change out of building technology, that they don't need to pay these vendors up front, that they can pursue a transaction-based model, provided that the constituents are actually getting something better. And, you know, I take a lot of pride in the fact that what we deliver through government is better than what was there before, because I'm, I'm definitely not here to sit around and just take a big government contract and, and say, hooray, that's not the point. Well, can I just say that having worked in government contracting, you miss an important part, which is not just the incentive to move slowly, but to actually not complete stuff, because that's how you get add ons and follow ons. And there was a number of years ago, I forget what it was. It was I know it was New York State was suing one of the like one of the big contracting companies that they had hired to build out something. And that company did exactly what New York State asked them to do. And New York State's like, we hired you because you're the experts. Like you knew that this was going to fail and you did it anyway. And they New York State it was like one of the few times I've seen the state actually win the case. But like the whole thing was like the the vendor knew from from go that this was never going to work. And they were like, yeah, of course we wanted to do that because then there's the follow on work to fix it. <laughs> like just insane. So, I mean, there's so much there. It's not just like, I don't know, government contracting is a, is a, is a brutal place for like, for when you think about the amount of just waste, wasted money, um, on these things and on these, on these things, I know where, you know, and so it's nice to see, I think, especially where you're talking about, um, a platform where it's interacting with government, but it's also into, you know, there's other players in this. It's not just some platform that the government is building for themselves, right? Like there's all these other things that have to interact with it. And if every state government is doing their own or then it becomes that much harder for a comp, you know, for all these companies and other players to integrate and work with those across multiple states. So I think that's really cool. I, mean, I, I think one of the things that I mean, what we we always loved about uh, Champ and I mean, you know, Shane's vision was um, to sort of turn the government model a little bit on its head. And we had a company that that was looking to do some work before with with governments, and and they sort of stopped because the the model is so difficult. It's like you tender something, it's sort of a big number and then the maximum that you could charge later is a percentage and then you're making your value for them is going like this and they're paying you like this it just doesn't make sense and the fact that Shane figured out how do we give the state something that actually doesn't just deliver something that their customers will want and will pay for but it actually could end up improving the fiscal situation of the states themselves, you know, and that I thought was really 
smart because in the end, I mean, that's what that's what you're trying to do. Like, sure, the better experience, but better experience and also better financial outcome. Right. And I think that 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 to me was what what always got my attention with Shane and 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 with Champ is that you know they didn't just go at solving the problem the same way that other people solve the problem just with more technology they actually flipped the business model over in a way that i think is super compelling it's yeah, really I, go ahead. yeah sorry to interrupt. I, one of the th- things that um you know is sort of i think core to our our set of beliefs is that um there's a there there's a there's a right way to be a, a citizen Right now, I happen to be fiscally conservative and socially liberal, but in my view, any citizen that abuses government spending is abu- is abusing themselves at the same time. It's our money. We paid the taxes, right? They're taking our money and reallocating it. If we're not responsible with the way the government's doing that, and we're not putting controls on it, and we're not giving them in the private sector the right incentives, their behavior's not going to create the outcomes we want, right? I, I can tell you, and anyone can tell anyone, exactly how someone will behave as soon as you understand their incentives. And the incentives attached to a vendor that gets paid up front are generally pretty bad. The incentives for government who doles the money out up front are generally pretty bad. But if you make it pay for performance and you partner, that's the that's the way public private partnerships should work. Like the rising tide lifts everybody and you've done it with capital efficiency. That means taxpayer dollar efficiency. And we lack that. And it's part of the reason why we have, you know, 30 some odd trillion of debt right now. I mean, I think that's, I mean, that gets into why it's so, I think slow to change as well is that if you look at how government generally has the incentives, if you work in government, a lot of times it's based on how big is your budget, how many people are working for you. That's why we end up having a lot of IT projects and other things that are housed within an agent, you know, within this government. And there's a lot of duplicative work and try and shift that more towards purchasing, the, purchasing outside and being more value based is is a it's, a it's happening, but it's slow. But it's it's nice to see that it's happening. Yeah, we run we run a, a number of episodes centered around dual use and. Um, you know, the injection of commercial technology to to help streamline, modernize, you know, government technologies. And a lot of that stuff really comes, smacks you in the face when you hear the stories of folks that are warfighters out there trying to get access to some sort of a you know, piece of information, but they can't do it. They can't streamline the technology because they didn't go through this one policy. And then, you know, they never really adapted to a more modern technology to make it more streamlined. and you know, get that information quicker and folks lost their lives because of it. And then you, you really hear stories of folks coming on and being very passionate about why they're determined to, you know, change the way things have been and try to break down, you know, some of these regulations that are so slow to uh, inject, you know, better technology into the system. So it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's an area that we're, you know, we're big advocates on, 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 the, on the podcast and our community at large. Um, I think it's really interesting what you guys are doing, uh, uh, you know, in prep for, for this, I was talking to a couple of, of, of friends about, you know, what you all do and, you know, it's, it's odd to think about, but it, it is, it's such an archaic thing, but everybody knows they've got that paper title somewhere tucked away. That's just got, you know, piles of dust, uh, in their old file cabinet. And it's like, I don't know why it's there, but it's there. Um, what States are you operating in? Uh, West Virginia, New Jersey, Kentucky, and uh, soon Illinois. Excellent. Excellent. And I'm sure there's a, a strategic roadmap to continue to build on that. We're, we're definitely rooting for you all and excited for the progress that you've made to this point. Um, Mike, you know, it sounds like a, a great partnership that you all have found. And uh, I, I respect and uh, admire the, you know, the, the model that you all have with being very diligent and intentional with it's a handful of, of portfolio companies and working with a select number of founders that you know that you can add value with. I think it's a really, really strategic partnership and 
um, you, know, you don't see it very often. So kudos to you all as well. I want to transition and close this out with the, uh, the final segment to the episode with the five second scramble. Here's where we, we go around, do a quick little rapid fire of Q&A, uh, uncover your deepest, darkest secrets. I'm joking. It's not it's a very light, very lightweight, fun. Uh, Mike, you're, you're going to lead us off with uh, Shane, and then I will get with you, Mike. Not at all confused. <laughs> not confusing at <laughs> I all. I will be doing the first round of questions with you, Shane, if that <laughs> helps clarify things, uh, which, <laughs> which Mike is which. Uh, having the name Mike means I, I'm sure Mike also feels this way that we it comes up a lot. Uh, anyway, uh, so yeah, so I'll ask you some questions uh, and they will be different. So uh, they're not, you know, you don't look at the same questions. Yeah, don't <laughs> don't start taking right. notes. Uh, there's a little <laughs> bit of overlap sometimes. All right, here we go. Uh, explain champ as if I were a five-year-old. We build new systems for DMVs. Uh, what type of technologists thrive at champ? The kind that treat no as a stumbling block on the way to yes. Nice. Um, what's the biggest uh, challenge facing tech execs in 2024? Wow. Uh, in the aggregate of tech execs, um, probably the underlying um, fracture in the economy where uh, I think a third of the country is in a really severe recession. A third is um, not saving, spending every dollar. And a third has no idea that, that this is going on with the other two thirds. So the knock on effect is that uh, you wind up having really disparate views of what correct compensation is. And uh, it's hard to manage that because you lose people um, because of reasons that uh, are external to your company uh the, the, it's their own fiscal constraints their spending issues the amount of inflation they're dealing with at home uh, it's a complex problem but complex maybe more of an answer than you wanted no that's that was probably one of the best answers i've ever gotten that was really <laughs> that great. Was great um i'm just i'm just taking it in uh <laughs> uh what's the uh, best piece of advice you've ever been given um if you're not living for the story then you're just not living uh what's a book every entrepreneur should read uh the monk and the riddle by randy commissar hold on while i write that down <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right uh what's something you did as a kid that you still enjoy doing Um, playing soccer. Cool. What position? Defense. Me too. Uh, back when I played. Now I don't play so much. Uh, what's the uh, largest land animal you think you could take in a street fight? No weapons, just bare hands. Like a bunny rabbit, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I've got so the so answer old. we've ever received. <laughs> <laughs> so old and slow. I, like I couldn't catch the rabbit, but I suppose if we were actually in a fight, I might. Have. <laughs> I mean, not the it's one in a cage. Not the one from Monty <laughs> Python, I assume. <laughs> uh, what's the most outdated piece of tech you can't let go? Oh God. Uh... I don't know. I am like tech forward as much as I can be. Um, I it's probably like the cords in my car. I I still use them more than you probably need to for given all the Bluetooth and everything that's available. Uh, what's a charity or corporate philanthropy that's near and dear to you? Uh, there's an organization here in Northeast Ohio. They're they're versions of this throughout the country. Um, it's an organization called Blue Coats. Um, when uh, a first responder is, is killed uh, in the line of duty, so, you know, fire, police, ambulatory, whomever, um, those families are, are left with a lot of needs, um, mortgages, schools, um, bills, funeral expenses, uh, the list goes on and on. Um, Organizations like Blue Coats around the country generally step in very quietly to uh, to be there to help 
Um, it's not a political statement. It's a reality of someone put their life on the line for us. And the least we could do for them is stand in their shoes while they're not here. Uh, last one. Uh, if you could live in any fictional universe, uh, which one would you choose? Oh, um, uh, what's that movie with most deaf, um, where it ends with the dolphin at the end? Um, Gosh, that was a good one. It's like, uh, oh, I'm, good. I'm blanking on it. This is going to bug me. Uh, ask, ask Mike his question and I'll secretly <laughs> Google it in the background. Um, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Yes, the Hitchhiker's yeah. Guide to the Galaxy. That would be where I'd live. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> great, great reference. With <laughs> it ends with the dolphin. That's good. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that was the movie and that I was uh, definitely sober when I watched it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right. Good stuff. Good stuff. All right. Uh, Mike, are you ready? Yeah, I mean, I guess. Let's do it. Um, what, what is your favorite stage of startup to, to work with? Uh, post-revenue pre-scale. What's the biggest pain point you would say facing startup founders in 2024? Making good decisions about who they choose to partner with. What's one trait that you find consistently in great founders from startups? Uh, honesty is an underappreciated trait. What would you say are the top two areas that you add the most value for founders across your portfolio? Try to limit the advice we give to things we actually know about. What's an area of tech that you're most excited to see impact the insurance industry in the next five years? Uh, oof. Um, Gosh, I don't, I don't know. Um, titling. So. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe titling. Titling. I mean, I, the, the reality is because I don't invest just to, for the insurance industry, I yeah. don't, I'm not, I don't know that I'm best equipped. Um, is there just an area of tech that you're excited about? I mean, look, I think all of this insurance companies have a ton of data and still are trying to figure out exactly what to do with it. So I do think sort of predictive data, using data to make better decisions. I mean, this is before all of the AI stuff, but I would say tools that help insurance companies better leverage data to make decisions. Okay. What, what's the favorite country that you've ever traveled to and why? Favorite country I've ever traveled to? Um, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna twist a little bit. Most recent uh, country I've traveled to that I was surprised at how much I liked. It. I, like I went to China a few years ago, and it was amazing. It was an amazing country. I thought it was gonna be really crowded and really difficult to get around, and it was Western and beautiful. And yeah, I mean, so many things about it that were surprising. Very cool. Um, I really enjoyed it. What's a charity or a corporate philanthropy that's near and dear to you? Uh, we've been getting closer to a group called uh, the Jed Foundation. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Um, it's a group around helping provide mental health uh, support services to high schools and universities, sort of really targeting um, the mental health crisis among adolescents. And so that's a group that we've, my family's been getting a lot closer to. I think it's an important issue. It's wonderful. Yeah, well, and we'll include both both of those uh, charities into the show notes as well. Just build some awareness for them. Uh, if you could have dinner with any tech icon, past or present, who would it be with? Dinner, oh, man. I mean, Steve Jobs. I think would be the one if I could. But mm -hmm. you like being insulted? <laughs> yeah, I do. I mean, I, I it's actually part of the reason I became an investor. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm good at taking taking insults. <laughs> What uh, what's the worst fashion trend that you've ever followed? Oh man, the hammer pants. <laughs> nice. 
We're going to need a photo, uh, photo yeah, credibility not. for that <laughs> yeah. to, put, to add to your hammer pants were part of my high school repertoire. Only on Fridays, though. Uh, Friday <laughs> hammer pants. It's good. All right. Uh, closing question. Uh, what is what was your dream job as a kid? What was my dream job as a kid? Man, it's a tough one. Um, I, I think, I mean, I wanted to be an athlete. I thought that that, that would uh, happen. And it did not. Athlete uh, investor. Yeah, yeah <laughs> exactly. So it's close, but it's not like- <laughs> close at all. <laughs> Um, but I will say my son who like, likes to play basketball, he, uh, he asked me one time I was putting him in bed and he was very serious and he's like, dad, what are we going to do if the Warriors retire number 30? And I was like, I guess you'll have to have them give you a different number. <laughs> His view was, I'm going to play for the Warriors and I'm going <laughs> to, so. Love Hopefully those ambitions. He, maybe he'll get his. I didn't get mine. <laughs> I love it. Uh, all right. Well, that's a wrap. I, I do appreciate you both spending the time with us on the pod. Uh, excited for the future of your all's partnership as well and, and wishing you guys best of luck. Thank you so much. Appreciate the opportunity to be here with you.